Thank you for having me in Chicago. I, I was reflecting during the last session that I've just come from a symposium of Ninth Circuit Court judges in San Diego, and we were all complaining about having eight vacancies and our caseload and how many, uh, how underlending the pressure was to keep track of the different ideas that were mentioned in oral arguments when we have six or eight cases a day. And then I thought, trying to follow the conversation in the last panel, that's a walk in the park <laughs> compared to being back in law school. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm going to talk about Richard Epstein and his writings in the area of takings and physical and regulatory and environmentalism. Beside his 1985 book, Takings, Part of Property and the Power of Eminent Domain, he also wrote a 2008 book, How to Revive Constitutional Protection for Private Property. He returned to the subject in his 2014 uh, classical liberal constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government. Richard has been a proponent of considering the language of the Fifth Amendment, which protects the taking of private property, not just real property, by government other than for public use and for adequate compensation. He has a high regard for the common law of nuisance, as we know. It should be a touchstone as a limitation to the exercise of the police power regulating land use. Any greater regulation, whether in the form of occupation by the government or reduction of the owner's use of the land, should be seen as a taking unless there is a compensatory advantage to the owner by the taking. He has traced the increasingly cost-free to the government regulation of land to the court's distinction between occupation of the land and mere regulation of the land with some caustic and pointed criticisms. This criticism includes, of course, the effects of environmental regulation for the benefit of persons who use the environment as well as animals to the uncompensated to, to, to the uncompensated by any average reciprocity to the landowner. He has drawn clear distinctions between the classical liberal philosophy of economic rights and land use and the modern progressive synthesis by showing the latter first defines narrowly what constitutes property and then enlarges the scope of public justification for regulation beyond the traditional reaches of common law nuisance. Frankly, he recognizes the mountains of political and judicial support for the current consensus as the state's power to limit the use of private real property. But he urges his readers to push hard here as in the area of contracts because both the real estate and labor markets must function well to produce a successful society. Today's presenters are Karen Bradshaw Schultz. Karen is um, a, a graduate of uh, UC Berkeley when she got a uh, BA, BS in Business Administration, a Master's in Business Administration from Cal State Chico, and then uh, with honors, and then University of Chicago Law School, 2010. After graduating from law school, she clerked for Judge E. Grady Jolly of the Fifth Circuit. Professor Bradshaw was a Koch Searle Legal Research Fellow at the New York University School of Law, and is currently an associate professor at Arizona State University, Saturday O'Connor's College of Law. The next uh, presenter will be um, Roying Chen, who is a research field law and economics. Her position is a research fellow at the, at the Peking University. Um, she specializes in law and economics and legal institutions with respect to economic development and the evolution of the market. And she'll talk about principally land takings in China and how that is uh, done differently from what we see here. Last, we have Professor Lior Strahilovitz of the University of Chicago Law School, who is known to all of you. Um, he graduated from Yale Law School. He's been a professor here for some years. And he will present uh, the curious case of Hyde Park's uh, two turns in the Taking Clause Spotlight, uh, which took place in the, in the famous fertilizer case. So without further ado, uh, I'll call upon Karen Bradshaw Schultz. And 
So my first law school class was with Professor Epstein, or my first semester classes was with Professor Epstein for torts. And there's sort of a puzzle here that I'll share in a moment, which is torts was my lowest grade in the first year of law school curriculum. But I felt incredibly honored to have Professor Epstein. I may have missed his book, it could have been a second quarter, I'm not sure. But what I do remember is that he was this beloved, legendary teacher, just as he is today. And students would line up after class and raise their hands and beg to be his research assistants. And I tried to stay very, very far away from that. I was completely intimidated by him. I, as my resume shows, am from a rural area of far northern California. I was absolutely terrified of all of my law school professors, who today I consider very fortunate to consider, to consider many of them some of my closest friends, uh, and who have mentored me for years and years and years. But at that time, Professor Epstein was not someone who I ever envisioned playing that role. Right. Uh, so I avoided him as much as possible, but at the end of the quarter, saw that on my exam was the highest grade of my law school first year class, written in red ink, nothing else. And I thought, oh, we must have done okay. So how did I get towards as the lowest grade and the highest grade in his class? Well, it was a split semester. And unfortunately, Tom gave me the lowest grade I have ever had. <laughs> but uh, Richard apparently took notice of my uh, exam Abilities to talk about cattle, I believe the exam, because the torts exam was about cattle grazing, which I happen to be deeply interested in. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, apparently did our pay on. Uh, but much to my surprise, two years later, his faculty assistant sent me an email and said, congratulations, you've been selected for the Bradley Fellowship, which is a award that you receive as a student to write a paper and attend the Law and Economics Seminar. And I wrote back and said, Dear Marjorie, thank you so much, but I'm afraid you sent the email to the wrong person. I have not, in fact, applied for the Bradley Fellowship. And she said, No, Richard has selected you. <laughs> and that was our second interaction. Uh, so I have to say, I've always been incredibly grateful for Richard to reaching out to me when I was so intimidated by him. And he has continued to do that again and again and again throughout my career. My third year of law school, he funded um, me attending a conference to learn some economic methodology I've never written about since, but now I have at least on my CV, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, he funded a fellowship uh, for me at NYU, which was an absolute game changer in my career. I absolutely would not be here today. I'd probably be writing a blog on fashion or something similar, but it was this crucial moment in my life where I was about to step off the academic craft he learned that I was not going to be able to attend um, a fellowship program outside of Manhattan, and in the spur of the moment said, there's this fellowship at NYU you should apply for. And I quickly Googled it and found that it didn't exist. And it turned out that the reason it didn't exist is because he was creating it for me. So again and again, he has created opportunities for me that I frankly didn't deserve, but was very, very grateful to receive. And I credit him hugely with the fact that I'm an academic today. So thank you, Richard. Uh, the paper that I'm presenting today is actually the student paper that I wrote 10 years ago. Uh, when I was invited to this, my first Festrich, I Googled how you write a paper for a Festrich, and it says, publish a paper you can't publish anywhere else ever. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I reached back into my brain and thought, uh-oh, I better, better think hard about what paper that would be. And in fact, I was talking to Richard at a different conference recently, and he said, you should write on the paper that you wrote at your job talk paper and when you were a student with me, which for a variety of reasons I hadn't published in the past. So I updated it pulled it out, and was shocked, but should not have been to learn the extent to which my scholarship and thinking about environmental law, land use issues, property disputes today is influenced so deeply by Richard's scholarship. Uh, that in the paper today, as is apparently the tradition, I am also deviating from his work and saying something perhaps different. So Richard, of course, has very strong views about property rights and the strength of property rights vis-a-vis -vis government regulation. Uh, he does admit that there is some limited role for government in certain kinds of land development projects, most particularly what he terms long and skinny projects. Things like pipelines, which require multiple moments of consent in order to receive a finished product. Uh, but as a general matter, he distrusts, this may be shocking to no one, the administrative state and instead thinks that many of these decisions are better held by property owners. And one of the things that has frustrated Richard for years, both in his personal life but also in his academic work, is the idea that an individual 
can have restrictions on private property, which are uncompensated takings, again, unsurprising, but not only by government, but also by private individuals who group together to oppose a particular project. And this has long been sort of a source of frustration. It's more recently shown up in his really most recent paper on the pipeline, the Dapple pipeline and the Standing Rock Sioux controversy. And so today, my paper really focuses on the flip side of the problem, sort of the unexplored thing. So there's a, a thing that sloths do, and I'm in no way comparing Richard to a sloth, but there is a thing that sloths do, which is if a sloth sees a person and they don't want to see the person, they cover their eyes and they believe the person goes away. So it's kind of fun if you're in Costa Rica or somewhere in the world, just covering the eyes of the sloth means they don't want you to be there. And in some ways, it's easy to do the same as a proponent of strong property rights with respect to how individuals oppose projects, right? Not government regulations or takings, but how groups of, you could call them concerned individuals, you could call them activists, you could call them NIMBYs, work together to constrain what a private individual may do on his or her private property. And so, Today, I seek to take off the hands from the eyes about their opposition interests, which are frequently treated in the literature and by courts alike as something that's sort of pesky and off to the side and not worth exploring, and instead delve deeply into these, what I term, opposition rights. Now, a quick caveat here. I'm not saying these should exist. I'm not saying how they came to be. I'm simply describing what they are and how they exist in the world. Of course, this relates in the future to thoughts about how they might be addressed and to what extent they should be strengthened or weakened by government interventions. But for now, I'm simply describing what they are, taking the hands off the eyes and looking at all the rights. And the way that I do that in this paper is through a case study. And the case study is from my hometown. Um, I'm from rural Northern California, as I mentioned. So this is near Mount Shasta. Uh, the town of McLeod has approximately 1,200 people. And during my later years of high school, when I was off to college, Nestle, the largest food and beverage manufacturer in the world, a Swiss uh, multinational corporation, came to McLeod and said, we'd like to buy your water rights. And the idea was that they would create a water bottling facility in the town of McLeod. Now, McLeod, the backstory is it was a company-owned mill town. So it was a timber town. It had the mill whistle still ringing every day. It was formerly this blue-collar community where every person had a comfortable home and a good job, or frankly, if they didn't, they were kicked out of town. Only the town employees lived there. And what happened over time in the 60s and 70s due to a variety of environmental regulations and market forces, uh, the timber companies ceased or lessened timber harvest in the surrounding communities, so the mill eventually shut down. And the cloud today looks nothing as it did when my grandfather or father were growing up there. It's a very, very different community. It tends to be economically depressed, uh, relatively low population in the wintertime, and then seasonal visitors who come from the Bay Area with vacation homes in the summer. Uh, so very different economic makeup than when it historically been. So when the residents in McLeod heard that Nestle might come and bring back this sort of blue collar working mindset that would allow people to stay in town instead of leaving, uh, they were very excited. The local residents, the people who had been there with their families for a long time, were very enthusiastic about that possibility. But what happened is the this format and fabric of this town had changed over time such that you had these seasonal residents who were no longer enthusiastic about the thought of truck traffic and blue collar sort of town set mentality. They'd come to Mount Shasta because it was a beautiful place with waterfalls and quiet, and that's what they sought to preserve. So you've had this very different set of interests, competing interests about what the fate of the town would be. And it turns out that McLeod in this development moment is in no way unique. This happens across the country hundreds if not thousands of times a year. It's happened in Saugatog, Michigan. It's happened near and far in virtually every community you can find at some point in history where there's been a similar fight for the future of the community. But what happened in McLeod is sort of representative of this broader trend in that these foreign factions weren't just two groups of people, right? These aren't just localized interests. As a 2016 Stanford Law Review article talks about astroturf activism, very frequently these quote unquote or ostensibly grassroots effort are in fact funded by large corporations, non-governmental organizations, a variety of interests that don't have a localized position on the interest, but instead have much broader views. So in the McLeod example, for instance, you have people who are opposed to bottled water, uh, who entered into the debate, and you also have people who are opposed to the alienation of water altogether, the sale of water rights. 
uh, who entered into the debate. And then, of course, you have Nestle, who is this giant corporation and is presenting itself through a very um, humble, soft-spoken man with a PhD who wore Wranglers and had a pickup truck in which he had two black gloves in the back. Uh, so everyone was sort of presenting themselves in a way they thought would play well to the local community. What happened, there was a six-year debate. There was a local election in which pro-Nestle candidates were elected. Uh, there were a variety of court cases that sort of wound their way through the system. But the sort of inexplicable result is as a formal legal matter, Nestle was absolutely allowed to develop in the class. There was no bar. The court said they could go ahead. The EPA had issued permits. The state of California had granted approvals. And yet Nestle chose to withdraw because the opposition became so strong. And that was a real conundrum for me as a law student. That's why, in some ways, I was interested in the outcome of this paper, because there was obviously something happening that we can't describe. It's just a matter of property rights, you know, private action on private land, or even government regulation or intervention, because in this case, there was no government. And that's where the idea of opposition rights comes in, right? So when you have a stakeholder, which I define as anyone with an interest in the outcome of a project, you can have stakeholder dynamics where different individuals combine forces. And sometimes you have this Baptist and Baylor dynamic where people with very different uh, rationale behind their positions combine to create a unified force for or against a project. And sometimes you have more traditional uh, forces coming together. But this interesting sort of stakeholder Stakeholder dynamic is occurring in virtually every opposition project. And what is it premised on? This idea of opposition rights, which I can imagine Richard's cringing every time he hears it, right? This idea that people who don't own property nevertheless have a stake in the outcome of the development project. And yet, again and again, in projects in a variety of areas of law, various case studies on topics ranging from wind farms to water bottling plants to nuclear siting facilities, it turns out that you see very similar dynamics where there is a private approval license or a private approval process. Some call it a social license to develop that is occurring in the background of what we traditionally think of as private action that is on their own land or government action. And so by exploring these opposition rights, I hope in this very, very brief essay, which is hugely condensed from its original format, to look at something that Richard has identified and worked against for years, but to explore it and delve into it instead of necessarily just pushing against it and showing the way in which this is operating in sort of a descriptive framework that hopefully can help people, regardless of their perspectives on how the project should unfold or whether they should unfold, understand at least the dynamics that are in place. Because for so long, we as legal scholars have said, no, those interests shouldn't exist, and so we have treated them as if they haven't. But again and again and again, in real world outcomes, these matter very much. Thank you. Do you want to yes. think, let's, let's escape out of this one? Okay. Sorry Close about it. this. <clears throat> uh, is this one? Yes, this one. Thank you. I am Rowan Chen. I was a student of uh, this uh, law school uh, to Professor Richard Epstein and also the, the dean then, uh, Sol Lefmore, and the current dean, Professor Thomas. And I'm very happy to be sitting with my property law professor, Neil <laughs> 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 Strelovitz. And two of my classmates were actually sitting in the back. <laughs> Hi, Mira Felix. So I'm really, really honored to be here. And I, I'm supposed to be teaching in China today. But I told my student and my current dean that I must come here because I will be sitting with, with my professors here. Uh, so it's, a re uh, it's really an honor today to be here. And also, I brought a present for Richard. Happy birthday, uh, Richard. This is a book which was released just yesterday, published and released in China, which is a translation of Richard's work. Uh, it says, uh, I think this is just one of the example about how influential Richard is in taking law in China in particular, and also in other areas of, of common law, and also employment law nowadays. It's an emerging and growing area. And also I want to say that uh, Richard probably owed me a lot because uh, I think largely because his class, the first class that I took is the torts class. In Richard's class, I found, I found myself lost. 
uh, but I was advised that I should stay on, and then I, because of this course, I think largely, and, and the other advice I got from here, I uh, gave up my job in Hong Kong as an IPO, uh, as a capital market lawyer, so I lost millions of dollars over the years. <laughs> but <laughs> all the uh, advice that I, I got from Richard and, he, and his family, uh, I think over the years, uh, has given myself and my family and also the legal education, I believe, in China, many inspiration over the years. So I want to say again, happy birthday, Richard. And also a present that I brought today is to tell you that your dream is somehow realized in China. You won't believe this. You've never written about China. I know about that. Uh, and, and the reason I said that is because uh, Richard believes in strong protection of property rights together with minimal government regulation. So in the area of takings law, especially takings law with regard to rural land in China, so we have two types of land, urban land, rural land. Urban land is owned by the state, literally, and rural land owned by some far collectives which are not even defined in law. And in the end, the state has a monopoly in buying these land, and turning them into state-owned land. Uh, so with respect to the rural land, there are essentially, there are certain rules, very vague, uh, providing very, very weak protection to property owners of these land. But in reality nowadays, if you look back 10 years ago in the news, you will see these heroic farmers who fighted against the government for taking their land with very, very little compensation. But over the years, things are changing very, very rapidly. So today, what I want to present is the case where the government is voluntarily overpaying the property owners of these rural land. And uh, more than that, it's non-discriminatory. So it's, it has nothing to do with special interest group trying to lobby the government for special favor to them. They are farmers who never really try to engage any kind of conversation with the local government. And also the possession is held by some low income residents who migrated from countryside into the city to work. So they are very, they're relatively, uh, they don't care very much so long as they can find a place to live. They are ready to go every day. But the government offered them non-discriminatory and completely transparent uh, compensation, which I regarded as overcompensation. And I will show you why. And then afterwards, I will explain why this happened, why the government, without all these uh, legal res restrictions, they can go for a much lower package under the law. And there's no court there requiring them to do so. And the central government didn't require them to do so. Why do they do that? There are conventional explanations, and I try to offer uh, something different, which I found out in the multiple uh, field trips. What I found is that it's a coordination, or you can say collusion, among the government themselves. There are three major players among the government departments, and it's in their best interest to do it this way. And finally, I want to explain that the reason that they, want, they are able to do it is because of the way that the local governments are financed in China. And there are problems there. And I try to offer some solution inspired by uh, my experience and also research in the securities market regulation. OK, so here's the, the project. There are multiple projects in one of the cities in China. They used to be relatively poor capital cities in terms of GDP. But over the years, they are uh, growing quite rapidly. And this province, uh, in particular, it ranked as the second worst in terms of GDP, just next to the better, uh, slightly better than Tibet. Uh, but in terms of, I will show you, in terms of the capacity in borrowing, in particular in the quasi bond market, local government bond market, it ranked as the third. And it's ranked as the fastest growing province among all the provinces in China. So this is the project. There, uh, you see there's a mountain there. So the farmers slowly built all these buildings along the mountains without any legal approvals, without any title. 
And then the government came along, they want to drill a hole through the mountain to build a tunnel to connect the two major roads. So this is the project. And uh, this photo was taken about uh, two months ago. And here's inside. You see, it's within the mountain. It's really, really shady houses or buildings. You can see from there. And this person uh, who got a compensation of about uh, four million RMB, uh, sorry, eight million RMB, which is, which enabled him to bought uh, three uh, apartment units in the city for his two sons and also other, other spare money to buy other properties. So he's here. The reason that he's here, he's introducing business to other property owners in the field to how to spend the, the money that they recently received from the government. And you will see that when they, uh, in the compensation measure, they actually used the uh, benchmark. The benchmark is the property price of the high-rise building that you will see behind, uh, in this photo. This high-rise building is uh, very close to this compound, and there's another one just right next to the project. So this is the benchmark for fair market value. And then inside, you see that it consists of the, these low-income uh, rental residents. And also, one component of the overcompensation, which is crazy, is that they have a very long list of items uh, which is ancillary items or attachments to these uh, apartment units, including satellite receivers or doors, and, and it will depend on the materials of your doors, you will be compensated differently. And what happened is that it's striking. This, uh, the photo was taken by my children. They were, they were curious, why do you need satellite receivers there and put them in such a weird way. It's because they bought them from the recycling station exactly for compensation. And nobody cares. So they just pile them up. And then they tell the official, these are the satellite receivers, and you should compensate me for that. So this is just one example. And another component of the overcompensation, which is interesting, is that with regard to this community, now they have about 80 owners who built all these apartments, but there are about 500 residents, rent, all on uh, rental residents, living in this compound. So in the past, what they used to do is that they won't provide any uh, utility connection to this community, hoping that they will die. And then these people will move away, and then it will be vacant, and then the government will come and smash and tear down the buildings. But what happened in this case is that the utility companies came uh, proactively. So they connect, they provide electricity, telecom, water, and also uh, police came. You will see it's a very, very uh, sophisticated way to protect a network of safety. You will see this bar uh, code on each building, on each unit of the building. If you use your cell phone and you scan, this is what, what it showed up on, on the other, on this photo. So you will know they actually have an address, even though the building was illegal. So they have an address. And it also shows you which police and the address of the police station, which is responsible for this area. And this is the name of the police who is responsible and his ID number in the police and also uh, other information. OK, so people are living comfortably here. They married here. This, is, uh, uh, this red thing shows that this is a, 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 an apartment for marriage, for, for the wedding. So it shows to everybody. OK, so this is the transparent. OK, so why do they do this? So the connection to the public utility, to the utilities, caused a delay for sure. It makes the community very attractive to low-income uh, rental residents. And so it also it, it actually increases the holdout problem. But the government did it. And they overcompensated the property owners. And meanwhile, the government, as I said, they have very, very little tax revenues. And they're very, very ambitious in trying to get this project down, to connect to the two roads, and then to claim the development to credits. So why do they do this? I think the reason might lie in the fact that the government is not just one single entity. 
So in current uh, analysis, we often treat the local government as just one entity. So they negotiate with property owners. They may work something for themselves. But here we have three major players. <coughs> The takings agency, the local police, and the utility companies, which are all state, uh, wholly state-owned companies in China. So what they do is that I think they have some shared goals. They all want to engage in empire building. So the bigger jurisdiction, the more people within their jurisdiction, the better. And meanwhile, they don't like conflicts. Once they have conflicts, everything will be broadcasted online, even though the government is good at deleting this information, still it's bad for them. So they want peaceful dealing with these people. And meanwhile, they have their, each of them has their distinctive goal. So the takings authority, they wanted to get the work done. They don't want it to, to drag on for too long. And they, don't, they probably don't want to pay too much. They have a budget. But meanwhile, you will see that in empire building, they want bigger budget. So how can they do this? The longer, the better, probably. For the police, they want to ensure safety for sure. So they uh, engaged in all these uh, high technology to show that they're getting their work done. And it's actually a very, very safe uh, community. And the utility company, they want to maximize their revenues. So this is exactly what they want to do. So you will see, sorry for the, for the chart, you will assign that. Uh, so under each, they have three choices here. Because the buildings are illegal, they are entitled to just drive people out and tear them down. But if they do that, so if they enforce the law, tear them down without uh, the compensation, because it's uh, the, the, uh, no one is entitled to ask for compensation, and they don't have to connect the whole community to the utility, but they will have to face consequences. For the takings authority, there will be a lot of conflicts, which is bad for them, uh, and conflicts also makes the police look very, very bad. The utility companies don't care, so it's a zero. For empire building, I assign three out of the three options, it's the wars because then people are scared, all the rental residents will be out, all the property owners probably will show up, and probably they will be hiding. So that's, <coughs> that's all three. And in the end, the result is that with respect to, to the agency, for the takings agency, it's probably a good one, a good choice to go. They don't have to pay very much, they get their work done pretty quickly. But for the police and the utility companies, it's bad ideas. It's the worst choice. So you have a one, three, three uh, results, and in the end, it's resisted, it's objected. Uh, and the, the second choice is to keep the status quo. So they don't tear down the building, but meanwhile, they don't have to pay compensation because they keep the building, and uh, they don't connect, uh, provide a connection, and you will see the result is the three to two which is okay, but if you look at the overcompensation this choice, they can tear down, but then they overpay people to drive them out, and meanwhile they provide, while they do execute the project, they provide a connection, and you will see that for empire building purposes, it's the best one. They get the most, uh, the largest number of residents under, under their jurisdiction. The police is able to claim for bigger budget for the high-tech network, and the takings authority also says that we have to pay people this amount of money. You have to give us more people and more budget in order to do this. A uh, utility company, they maximize their revenues. They keep, keep collecting revenues. So that's the result. And I guess every government likes to do that. But the reason that they are able to do that is because of this very unique financing structure. They are able to borrow with the corporate entities owned by the government, not the local government itself. It's prohibited by law for them to do so. But they can set up corporations to do so. And this is exactly what they did. Uh, I will skip this. And um, I think Julie is not around. Julie has been writing about the harm of, of for go local government to borrow with no scrutiny almost which Richard probably likes, no regulation on this borrowing. And uh, we do have some uh, reaction solution to that, but the current solution are all based on aggregated fiscal data. 
So a local government tell you how much revenue I had, what's the source of the revenue, what's my budget, and you don't know exactly what's the impact or what's the cost and expenses of each specific project. So I propose that we should do something what I call smart disclosure, sorry for the word, it's a popular word in Asia right now when we talk about regulation. And it's, I hope it's smart in a way that uh, it will require project specific information on the spending and the potential benefits. And also it, the information must be provided in standard, uh, standardized forms. And the reason is that I wanted it to be so people who are interested, maybe the central government, maybe some other market players, they will be able to compare these data relatively easily. So that's the idea. Thank you. Two of my former students. I was relieved to hear that I didn't give Karen either her worst grade or her second worst grade in law school. <laughs> I recall her being an excellent student in property, uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's a moment of great pride to, um, to get to share the podium with, uh, with two extraordinary scholars. Um, it also makes me feel old, but that's. Uh, that's <laughs> so uh, it's also just a terrific honor to get uh, to get to be here as part of a, of a session. Um, uh, commenting on and, and uh, reliving some of Richard's extraordinary contributions to uh, legal education, to the world of ideas. And uh, I'm going to do something crazy, which is uh, disagree with Richard about the takings clause to some extent. Uh, I'm also going to say a few words about Horn with the uh, uh, advocate who uh, uh, won the Horn case multiple times uh, sitting in the room, Michael McConnell. <laughs> Uh, although I won't disagree with the results, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest maybe that Horn was right in a way that um, others have not previously suggested. But I want to start with an old story about the neighborhood that we sit in. And uh, this was a case I actually knew almost nothing about, uh, but came across it as thinking about, as I was thinking about topics for this uh, symposium, and kind of fell in love with it. So uh, it's a story that starts with the Chicago Stockyards which are, as most of you know, the, the world's largest slaughterhouse, uh, the largest killing factory the world has ever seen. And uh, it was founded, as you can tell, if you really squint at that picture in the 1860s. Right? Uh, the Chicago Stockyards uh, very quickly created some problems as the scale of uh, livestock slaughtering occurred on an unprecedented uh, way. And uh, that problem was, OK, what to do with all the byproducts? Okay, so picture on the left is the Chicago Stockyards in the 1940s, sort of an overhead view. Picture on the right, I think, is a uh, early 20th century, maybe late 19th century photo of what some of the working conditions were like inside the stockyards. And these are a couple of pictures of what the presence of the Chicago Stockyards did to the Chicago River. Uh, those of you who know the Chicago River know that it is not a swiftly moving body of water. And uh, various East Coast cities uh, had um, stockyards that were uh, smaller scale, and they would simply flush the blood and guts from the animals that had been killed out into the ocean. Chicago couldn't do that. There is no ocean. And so we dumped it into the Chicago River uh, for a decade or two, and it did this to the Chicago River. Uh, the picture on the right is an interesting one. It's Bubbly Creek. If you look, sort of, if you really squint at the picture on the right, you can actually see a chicken <coughs> walking across the Chicago River. That gives you some sense of the quantity of pollution that was, uh, that was being dumped in there. Uh, more precisely, the estimates from uh, this case I'm talking about uh, in a moment were that about 2 million gallons of blood and offal. Is it offal? Does that sound right? Offal? Uh, the word for animal parts uh, that were uh, left over from killing uh, were dumped into the river. And this was, of course, a very bad thing. Uh, as Tom Merrill had written about, uh, it created an environmental catastrophe for the city of Chicago because, of course, at the time, the Chicago River flowed into Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan was where the city got its drinking water supply. So all this offal was winding up in people's teacups. Not a good thing. Uh, the Illinois legislature came up with a three-part plan to try to deal with this catastrophe and preserve the uh, cleanliness of the drinking water supply. First, in a really audacious, uh, audacious feat of engineering, they decided to reverse the flow of the Chicago River 
so that it would not flow into Lake Michigan, but would flow from Lake Michigan into the Mississippi River down towards St. Louis. There's really a <laughs> thing to be dealing with that. Um, and they got it done, uh, miraculously, after spending several million dollars. Point two, they'll dig a massive tunnel several uh, miles into Lake Michigan and basically move the drinking water intake from right by the shore to a part of the lake that was relatively less polluted and had cleaner drinking water. And those two aspects of the Illinois plan are the most widely known. But there's also a third part, which is the Illinois legislature chartered a fertilizer company that was going to take all the blood and all the offal and turn it into fertilizer, which could be used for agricultural purposes, both in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And it's that third step that gave rise to a really fascinating takings case in the United States Supreme Court. So uh, the relevant uh, language that we need to look at from the corporate charter of the Northwestern Fertilizer Company is on the board. It's a longer short of charter, but these are the provisions that really matter. And essentially what the Illinois legislature was empowering the Northwestern Fertilizer Company to do was gather up a whole bunch of blood and guts and turn it into fertilizer. I'll come back to section five in a little bit because it has some important language. All right. Once this fertilizer factor factory got up and running, uh, it created, as, uh, as you get the sense from reading the trial court uh, record, possibly the worst odor the world had ever seen. <laughs> so uh, one resident of Hyde Park referred to the odor as lingering over Hyde Park like the angel of death. But that wasn't the most colorful testimony. That was from a Civil War veteran who had fought at the Battle of the Wilderness and smelled the smell of men and horses on fire and said that the smell from the Northwestern Fertilizing Company was much worse. <laughs> a local physician said the smell was so bad that it had uh, caused many of his patients to contract cholera. In hindsight, that's probably not right. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the physicians were still learning. This was in the 1870s. Uh, the defense testimony was, we're doing everything we can. We're using all the best possible techniques to try and uh, ameliorate the smell. but." The defense uh, witness, some chemists conceded under cross-examination, the smell would be made better if instead of trying to process all of the cities or nearly all of the cities, blood and offal in one spot, it was spread out and processed at a few smaller facilities. And that concession, I think, would loom large. Uh, in any event, the smell was so bad that in Kenwood, six miles from the factory, people could still smell it and were bothered by it several, uh, several days a month. And Hyde Park, which at that point was just starting out, a little village of 3,000 people, made the Northwestern Fertilizer Company public enemy number one, and the town founders resolved that they would shut it down. They did this by banning people from carrying blood and offal from the stockyards through the village of Hyde Park. The only train tracks that could get you from the stockyards to the fertilizing company were going to go right through Hyde Park. And uh, essentially, Hyde Park said that stuff couldn't be carried. The fertilizer factories employees ignored that uh, city ordinance or that neighborhood ordinance uh, for a little bit. And then Hyde Park started arresting railroad employees who then refused to remove any of the blood and guts from the factory. Uh, the decision of the trial court to shutter the factory, essentially, by imposing distance <coughs> liability um, and by rejecting a taking suit by the Northwestern Fertilizer Company essentially resulted in the factory being shuttered. And the Supreme Court wound up affirming that trial court judgment, which was financially brutus. So if you adjust for inflation, uh, they lost almost a $6 million investment in today's dollars. And it was in that case, Fertilizing Company versus Hyde Park, that the Supreme Court, I think for the first time, embraced what's now a canonical doctrine, which is that when the government uh, abates nuisances, it doesn't incur takings liability. Uh, the court also rejected the fertilizing company's argument in that case that the corporate charter, which I showed you a little bit of before and I'll show you a little bit of again, uh, actually immunized the uh, factory against the possibility of a nuisance suit. Now, very few people have written at any length about the Northwestern Fertilizing Company uh, case, but Richard has of course. In, his magazine, in his book on takings. And what he said is that clearly this was a nuisance, but the charter with the state, the corporate charter, essentially instructed the fertilizing company to go out and do this thing, and thereby implicitly immunized them against the prospect of nuisance liability. And at first, I was a little bit puzzled uh, by that interpretation. Uh, sorry? We'll talk more about it. We'll talk more about it. At first, I was puzzled by that reading to suggest, as the dissenter did in the Northwestern Fertilizer Company, 
that uh, implicit in the corporate charter is the prospect that uh, the factory cannot be shut down in a nuisance suit. But then after reading the language, I thought, well, maybe. Okay, so the highlighted language in section five was empowering the factory to take any and all offal, dead animals, and other animal matter, and turn it into fertilizer. What a, well, if any and all really does mean all, all the, fur, all the runoff from the Chicago stockyards, then maybe what the corporate charter was saying is that implicitly, unprecedented scale was going to be permitted. And it seems likely that the legislature might have, in empowering uh, the company to do that, understood that that would mean that the ordinary laws of nuisance would not apply. There's no other provision in the charter that says anything about nuisance law and whether it would apply or not. So I think that's the best textual argument that one can make. All right. Uh, it's not until you delve into the trial court record that you figure out that any and all probably didn't actually mean all. And thus, I think the best reading of the corporate charter is not that the fertilizer company was allowed to do what it did without worrying about a nuisance suit that would shut it down. And the reason is, if you go to the trial court record, it turns out there were actually two factories in the city limits, one immediately adjacent to the Chicago stockyards, but operating at a much smaller scale, that were turning offal into fertilizer. And so, it simply can't be the case, and that, and that, uh, uh, and that second company got up and running the same year as the Northwestern Fertilizer Company was chartered by the state of Illinois. And so in order to read any and all as literally all, you have to assume, I think, that sub silentio, the Illinois legislature tried to shut down this other operating company, Thompson and Edwards. And that simply doesn't seem plausible. Indeed, one of the star witnesses for the defense at the Northwestern Fertilizer Company's trial was Mr. Thompson from Thompson and Edwards, who was in the same business Can and suggesting that Northwestern was doing everything. But one slide back. Yeah. yeah. So that's the, so section five, I think you're right to say, if there's language that gets at this problem, it would be section five. And I think the presence of two companies rather than one. Can you explain this? Because it's all, any and all which they may buy or own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why would that apply to, the, to a competitor company? Well, so I think the idea is, the question is, can you, um, can you operate a, um, is, is the charter authorizing a company to, author it, to operate at essentially an unprecedented scale? Right. So the question is, I think, in order to get to the reasoning that says this charter immunizes the Northwestern company against the prospect of nuisance liability, you would have to say, we are empowering them to acquire all the OFL that they want to from the city of Chicago and then process it. Otherwise, I think the reasonable assumption about what Section 5 and the charter as a whole means is, of course, they can get into this business and we want them to locate at this particular locale. But if they're going to do so, they're going to have to abide by useless <coughs> laws, just like they're going to have to abide by tort laws and criminal laws and other kinds of provisions. So in other words, we've got a silent corporate charter on the questions of nuisance liability. <coughs> to me, the best argument for suggesting that sub silentio we're trying to eliminate the ability of either private or public actors to sue for nuisance would be this any and all language. And I don't think that language gets the company where, where it needs to get. Maybe there's other arguments, and I'm sure Richard may come up with uh, some uh, in his rebuttal. OK, so why is fertilizing company important? Well, it's important because there's a long line of ultimately more famous cases, Muggler versus Kansas, Miller versus Shaney, uh, Hadachek versus Sebastian, that are going to take the rationale of the fertilizing company case and run with it and hold that when the government invokes the nuisance control rationale to impose substantial harm on a property owner, it doesn't owe damages. And indeed, I think it's also important because it influenced the case decided by the Supreme Court just about a month apart, Patterson versus Kentucky, which involves the following facts. Someone gets a patent on a kind of improved oil, an oil that will burn at less than 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And Kentucky says, that's not improved oil. That's oil that's going to blow up and catch on fire uh, uh, more regularly than regular oil will. So we're going to ban it in the state of Kentucky. And the owner of the patent said, well, you've just reduced the value of my patent in Kentucky to zero. And I had all this improved oil in Kentucky, chattel property, and you've made that impossible to sell. So I'm going to bring a taking suit both for intellectual property and for chattels. And the Supreme Court, I think, influenced not only by the facts before it, but, but by the facts of fertilizer company as well, said there's no taking in either case. OK, so now I want to talk about a contemporary problem in takings law that I think perhaps the Northwestern Company might shed some light on. And that's the inconsistent treatment in the law of takings of land and chattel property. 
So two cases decided several decades ago are seemingly in great conflict with one another. One involves a federal ban on the sale of eagle feathers, both from bald eagles and the golden eagles. And that was held not to be a taking, even though it applied to existing eagle feathers and Native American artifacts that used them. Fast forward eight years, a case called Hodel versus Irving. Now there's a federal statute that limits the ability of owners of Native American properties to fragment them, um, and to fragment them and to, and to transfer either by intestacy or by will, to transfer high, very small parcels of land to their next of kin. Um, and this was found to be a taking. All right? The two cases are in conflict. In a very famous case called Lucas, Justice Scalia has to try and reconcile this conflict. And one of the things he says is, well, I think what we understand if we read both the Eagle Feather case together with Hodel versus A. Irving is that the state has more leeway to restrict chattel property ownership than it does to restrict the ownership of land. That was his effort to reconcile the two. And then in the Horn case, uh, which Judge McConnell won for the Horns, the court walks back that Lucas distinction to some extent. Okay? So Lucas involves a physical appropriation of a portion of the Horn's raisin crop. And the Ninth Circuit, the court below, looked at that language from, from Lucas and said, well, clearly if, they were, if the government was doing this to land, that would be a per se taking. But because they're doing it to chattel property, personal property, it's not. Uh, I think the Ninth Circuit had a plausible reading of Lucas, but the Supreme Court reverses. And the Supreme Court held that a permanent physical uh, occupation of chattel property should be treated just like a permanent physical occupation of land. They should both be per se takings. And after Horn, a lot of academic commentators have suggested that maybe this means that Andrus versus Alford, the Eagle Feather case, has basically been overruled or is uh, walking uh, dead. And that going forward, we should expect that not only physical takings cases, but regulatory takings cases will start to treat land and personal property the same. Now, for Richard Epstein, this isn't a problem. He doesn't think there should be any distinction between physical uh, takings and regulatory takings. And I want to suggest that's an appealing way to resolve the issue, but I'll suggest one other potential one as well, which is that as we go through all the cases involving government, um, uh, government appropriations of chattel property, and the Northwestern Fertilizer Company is one of those, but it's just the first of many, in all of these cases where the government's doing that, they're basically rendering property contraband. So you can see that in the prohibition era cases where we're shutting down alcohol distilleries. But you can see it in a lot of other cases, even some modern cases where video gambling machines are rendered contraband uh, in the 20th and 21st century. Okay? And what's different about Horn is that the government was purported to take property or to render certain property valueless while not ever asserting that the raisins it was taking were contraband. So that suggests that what Horn, was, what our Department of Agriculture was doing in Horn was truly unprecedented. And I haven't found a case that it looks like Horn where a taking hasn't been found. So this suggests, for example, that Horn comes out differently if the government decides to ban all raisins in the same way that the prohibition statutes would have banned all commerce in alcohol. And it might suggest that Andrews versus Allard can actually survive to this day, notwithstanding the equation of real and chattel property that's happening in the Horn case. Um, and indeed, the state really rarely renders land contraband. But if the state were to do something like that, imagine that we're really easy to enrich uranium into plutonium. And so the state says, well, individuals no, have, no longer have the right to mine uranium on private property. I would suggest that that not, ought not to be an unconstitutional taking, because the government is being so sincere about the police power justification that they're willing to limit all market transactions in it whatsoever. OK, last slide. Um, so last slide is this. Let's suppose that fertilizing company had come out the other way. What might have happened? Well, it's possible that the market would have engaged in a series of cozy bargains <laughs> to try and eventually turn the south side of Chicago into a largely residential development, although I kind of doubt it. Uh, why? Boy, there were some tremendous transaction costs. And the city and the state governments were completely tapped out from having spent millions of dollars uh, rerouting the Chicago River and digging these massive tunnels into Lake Michigan. And if the fertilizer company had been there within smelling distance of the place we're now sitting, it seems hard to imagine that 12 years later, 
the Rockefellers would have said, hey, let's build one of the greatest universities the world has ever seen and put it right next to this fertilizing factory. Uh, now, Richard Epstein would have been a world-class academic no matter where he had landed. But we like to think that his presence in this campus and this community, his proximity to a number of great scholars may have influenced the shape of his legal scholarship. And perhaps Richard Epstein would have landed on another faculty and chosen not to write uh, the greatest book in the history of Takings Law. <laughs> so in that sense, we might think that Hyde Park's first moment in the sun with respect to the Takings Clause, this somewhat obscure 1978 case, contributed to its second more enduring testament. <laughs> Floor is yours. Where's my cash, mistress? Right here. We're going to go through about 12 times because we started a little bit later. All right. OK, so what I'm going to do is my 15 minutes of fame and then sit down. No, not sit down. Yeah, sit down. Look, it's a really great honor. I mean, I can't tell you how close I am to everybody on, on these particular panels. Um, Karen was my student here. Karen worked with me at the, uh, the NYU Law School. We've been in constant collaboration. One of the things that she forgot to mention is the conference we put together on firewall, if you remember, at the University of Arizona, which I contributed a paper which we funded through the University of Chicago Law and Economics Program. It just goes on and on. Uh, Roy Ying came as a student of mine. I actually supervised her PhD thesis, and I wrote her a letter of recommendation in Chinese in order to help her get a position in Beijing. <laughs> How was this done? Uh, well, it turns out another one of my very close friends a man named Yun Xian Chang, um, in fact, was at the NYU who sat in on all my classes. I wrote the letter, he translated it, and the rest of this all turns out to be history. And Lior, I guess, has been a colleague and a stout friend and a consistent critic since he came here many, many years ago. And the special that I owe to him is he always manages to help me find a research assistant um, who allow me to continue to go forward, as well as being a thoughtful and penetrating critic of my work, as you can see from the uh, little slides that he put up, which I, of course, will try to respond to at least in time. Uh, dealing with the first of these two papers, one of the things that it really raises is the question about the interaction of formal and informal norms about the way in which various things go. Um, in the city of Chicago, one has seen things quite similar to that. Um, it turns out when they wanted to expand White Sox Stadium and Comiskey Park and so forth, there was, of course, systematic overcompensation that was provided to the local um, folks. It was not a surprise. This was the 11th Ward. This was the homes of genuinely powerful people. And what you did is you got yourself into a situation where we have what is sometimes called affectionately the eager plaintiff. Uh, far from there being an unnatural attachment to land, there's an incredible willingness to sell it for a market premium, particularly if you can use the money to buy yourself a nice house in a nice neighborhood, courtesy of what the government starts to do. And so when you're trying to figure out the ways in which these things go, it is important to have a sort of deep public choice explanation of the ways in which the interactions of political forces go with respect to doctrine. And in many cases, what Karen talked about is there, uh, she did not know it, uh, but she mentioned the word that is going to be my comment on her. She mentioned the word sort, right? She did not know that I worked on the sort of case, did you? No. So let me tell you a bit about the sort of tub case, because it, it sort of indicates this, and I want to show you how crazy these things can get with the political stuff. In Sorgatuck, there was a developer, who, uh, Warren McClendon, who wanted to come in and put this very fancy house project up, a golf club and so forth, in an area which was right by the uh, Lake Michigan, divided in half by a kind of sorted river, which was controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers with the North and South Park. And I mean, in order to get through this thing, they had to do a foot-by-foot -foot analysis of all the local flora and fauna to make sure that no endangered species would be hurt. Uh, it turns out, of course, this is a beautiful beachfront site which nobody walks by uh, compared to the main shopping street in uh, Sorgatuck, which is absolutely crowded. And he had this north and this south piece that he wanted to do it. And what happens is the locals, for the most part, were somewhat mixed. But they kind of salivated over the possibility of getting higher real estate taxes by virtue of the fact that the land could be used for productive uses. And the moment that the prohibitions were started to put into play, uh, what McClendon and company did uh, was they immediately demanded a tax reduction to take into account the reduction of value, filed a bunch of takings challenges on which I worked. 
I'm not going to tell you about the endless stuff, but it was very clear what Karen said was at work. The locals were in general in favor of this, but the opposition was funded by environmental groups that lived in the neighborhood, but not in the local community. And you had the same thing she talked about uh, up in Cloud the Cloud. You had elections that were disputed, voting box that were stolen, and so forth. But I just want to talk about one little piece of it to show you how constantly crazy this could turn out to be. McClendon gave up on the north part, but wanted to do the south part. And he had this little easement that he had to buy in order to get trucks through there. And the easements only worked for cars. And so what happened is he offered to pay the owner of this land, which was worth $75,000, $10 million in order to buy the easement, and it was turned down. Um, and why is it? Because the environmental group said you have to stand for this. What then happened is our good friend McClendon gave up this whole battle, and he gave the thing to charity. And at that point, it's now a condemnation for public use. So the government took the easement and paid the guy $25,000 when he could have gotten slightly more money from the other side. Uh, so it kind of starts to tell you when you're dealing with these kinds of cases that not only do you get opposition groups doing odd things, you get bizarre behaviors taking place in consequence of what is happening. And in my own particular view, in this particular situation, if you ask yourself the high Park fertilizer question, was a guy building a luxurious golf course on a beachfront property creating a common law nuisance? I don't see this as a close and anxious case. And so I thought that the entire thing should have gone off on the following proposition. Yes, you can condemn this land, but he just paid $40 million for it, and it was worth more than that to him. So pay him full value, and the property is yours, and you can turn it into this conservation park. That never happened. And the moment you get rid of the compensation requirement in non-nuisance-like cases, what you do is you open up the thing for all sorts of intrigues uh, one way or the other. And the same thing kind of happens when you start looking at the China connection and so forth that, that Roy Dean started to talk about. I think the end product, which he talks about the various public choice uh, influences on this and the various groups, that they sort of came out with the optimal solution by overcompensation is in fact extremely important because one of the reasons why you end up with overcompensation is you're not buying property in many of these communities. What you're buying is an elimination of political resistance by well-positioned interest groups who in fact will start to create all sorts of opposition for collateral reasons because one of the things that you always have in the these cases as illustrated by the Sorbetuk situation which travels seamlessly onto China is that when you're dealing with land, there are so many adjacencies, sort of implicit externalities, some of which are actionable under the law of nuisance, most of which are not, uh, that the dynamic with respect to the land is going to be much more difficult than with respect to something which is isolated. Because I think everybody understands there are really three categories in the law, not two. Uh, it's not just a question of having consensual parties on the one hand and strangers on the other hand. It is also the case uh, that there are these ambitious people known as neighbors who come along who sort of fall into an independent category where the externalities are always large on the one hand but not necessarily actionable, and they're going to start to influence what's going on. Um, when Roy Ying wrote her thesis, what she did was to talk about the question of how it is that you try to convert some of these um, rural lands into greater developments. And the methods that she talked about there, I think, indicate some of the strategies that start to take place. Uh, you have to figure out when you condemn it, not to condemn one little piece, but you've got to condemn it all. And so what she suggested then, and which has been used in many communities, you create special districts, and then by supermajority vote, you decide whether or not you want this thing to be condemned. And then you then do it on the other side, you pay a premium over the uh, market value so as to overcome the resistance by those people whose subjective value may be greater than market value. And in a strange way, what you can do is you can make this work. Uh, the ability to sort of understand how the formal and informal mechanisms work, moreover, on this particular point is complicated by yet another kind of difficulty, which is it's not clear in China that anybody owns anything by virtue of the fact of the state ownership system. So this is, again, a Roman law problem, uh, which is <laughs> assignment, your first writing assignment, was the question of how do you figure out how private institutions are put together in any society where it turns out that the state has legal title to the property and nothing by way of adverse possession can ever allow you to acquire that property. And it turns out the Romans and the um, 
a Chinese who's exactly the same mechanism to deal with this, which is perpetual leases where the only remedy that you get in the event that you are evicted is some kind of damage award, you don't be able to stop your projects in question from going. So uh, what you see is you go kind of, of course, all these systems, uh, any system of absolute ownership that you have with state power has to give rise to a second tier of institutions. And Roy Ying is at this point, I think, been on many of the Chinese commissions that have talked about all of this stuff, right? Trying to figure out how it is it can take that subtext and make it a little bit stronger. Uh, because if you don't make it stronger, there's been a lot of good work, much of it done by my good friend um, Gary Leibacap, uh, which sort of indicates the ability to borrow on land when the title is insecure all uh, goes down fairly dramatically. Now, coming to Lee, um, you know, he has basically talked about a case which has been near and dear to my heart, the Hyde Park fertilizing case with respect to the nuisance situation. And in effect, this is the case in which the Epstein position, as it's sometimes called by me at least, um, <laughs> deals with the issue of whether or not when the government has to figure out what it's going to do. Essentially, the position that I've always taken is what you first have to do is to figure out what the optimal distribution of property rights is, is between neighbors. And it turns out it's very difficult to get a kind of a really firm grip on the notion of what counts as an externality. So the experiment that I've always worked with is one which you start with a single owner. And what they do is they start conveying out all these properties to individuals who become neighbors to one another. And the question you ask is what kinds of restrictions do they invariably include in these covenants that they sell so as to keep these, to maximize their total value? Those when you don't have a common ownership you imitate are the ones that are there sometimes not, you leave the private covenants to do. And the invariant feature is always the common law of nuisance, subject in Tom Merrill's, who we talked about, these various offsets having to do with living, with living locality rule, all of which are essentially designed to sort of increase the value of the property by allowing reciprocal harms under circumstances where you're reasonably confident that what you get in the additional freedom of action for all the people in this common space exceed the burdens that you bear on the cost side. And the basic explanation is you have forced exchanges of these kinds of interests where they create parade of improvements, preferably with an equal distribution of the surplus so as to avoid competition over just how much I gain relative to how much you gain. And this book I wrote on bargaining with the state was a book about how you distribute surplus through legal doctrines, and it works, I think. Well, in the high part case, the reciprocity principles don't seem to work very well. And so the question then is, what do you do with this? And I've already answered that question when I commented on what Kathy said. Because I said, if you're dealing with the preemption issue, you never want the government authorization uh, to destroy a private right of action if you've committed a common law tort against a stranger. And that's exactly the kind of movement over here. The kind of issue that I think arises in dealing with exactly what it was that Leo was talking about. Uh, so I've always thought that the case was extremely powerful. The harder question is, uh, the state will never be able to escape damages, and damages would be extremely large. The question is, what about an injunction? And I think if you go back and you look at the Hyde Park case, and I just reread the head note, what they said is what is characteristic of 19th century logic, which is whenever there's a charter which is granted, you only infer from the grant those things which are necessarily, which are explicitly conveyed or conveyed by necessary implication, and that the ability to commit nuisance against other individuals does not fall into either of those two classes. So the injunction would be permissible. If, on the other hand, the charter allowed you to basically stink up the world, they could never escape the damage action. And those actions probably would have been sufficiently draconian uh, that these guys would have tampered their behavior one way or the other so that the University of Chicago could have been built after all. Uh, so I, I thoroughly agree and indeed absolutely insist. I never concede anything you understand. I always insist that the people who are criticizing me are right. Um, and I don't think this is a criticism uh, that the nuisance part is absolutely there. Uh, the question then is, what do you do in other kinds of cases where there isn't a nuisance kind of rationale? And the reason why I tend to treat the, some of the cases that were talked about in a slightly different fashion is because I think that's there. So go back to more. You know, I've been very critical of Michael for winning this case after thanking him for having done so. And I think the complication in that particular case has nothing to do with whether or not it's a physical taking, which it surely is, 
It rather has to do with a much more complicated question of whether these guys were compensated by virtue of being part of a cartel, which I think changes the equation somewhat, and also indicates that you've got the right problem there, but you may have the wrong plaintiff. It's the consumer should do it. On Anderson Allard, uh, just to finish this off, that's a case limiting the rights of disposition. I have no question that it's a prima facie case of the taking. There's no nuisance justification for stopping it, but there is the question of whether or not you have to stop it in order to prevent the deprecation of a common pool item, which is a legitimate situation. So that real question is one that I don't think the case dealt with, um, which is whether or not this was over-inclusive in terms of the way in which it designed the thing, whether there are ways you could have had people register things so that they could sell it and so forth. Uh, so what you really need there is, again, the same problem I mentioned before, is when you're going to have an intrusion of basic rights, trying to figure out the remedial part of the structure is much more complicated than it would be. And my criticism of the taking law to be put into a single sentence, and I'll stop with this sentence, is, is if what you do is you truncate the issue and simply eliminate the taking by preventing a total restriction on sale isn't there. You never face the police power questions with the urgency that they need to take place. And if you did that, my guess is that they would probably have to trim these down somewhat and I thought, therefore, that the case was wrongly decided. So now I received this little note from Patrice that I should please continue as long as I want, but out of the generosity of my heart, I received it. Thank you. All right, we'll open the floor to questions to the panelists. Yes? So uh, the combination of Karen's and uh, Bjorn, 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 you wonder why the overcompensation solution that China has adopted is not the answer to the problem Karen has described. Uh, and the only thing I could think of is that maybe in the Chinese situation, the identity of the people to overcompensate is a little more clearly established, although apparently they're not legally living. But they're, they're possessing property and they can be identified as the people that they are in. So they overly compensated and induced to leave, whereas Karen's situation sounds like you've got a more fluid combination of like uh, busybody interest groups uh, that may or may not be identified uh, with a particular physical property that can be overcompensated and so forth. So it's much harder to take a collective action by the process. Yeah, I'm just wondering what your reaction to that is. Uh, they are, uh, just a quick comment about the facts. Uh, there were two attempts to reverse the Chicago River, one in the 1870s, which lasted one year and then failed. Which is like, got to be the one that uh, the court was talking about in 1878. The second one that stuck was started in 1900. Yeah, there were two cases that came out of it. Right? Right. And the second one, interestingly enough, denied belief in Justice Holmes in yes. a really fine opinion. So you can't prove that your schmutz was the stuff that yeah. did everything in St. Louis. Because there was so much other filth being added to the river downstream that if you figure out who was responsible. Hey, it was actually an extremely astute analysis yes. of the, of the nuisance issue. Yeah. Well, and it was a very, very well done opinion, I might add. Oh, hi again. Hi, Okay, I will, um, should I, Go ahead. I answer? Okay, uh, so in China, I think it's both yes and no. Uh, yes, it's because the, the property owner, the owners of the land is, uh, is identifiable, as you said. They are farmers belonging to the same collective, which owns this mountain uh, that I show in the photo. Uh, but on the other hand, I think a no is because... They have, like, they have unique uh, rights, particular parts within the collective? Uh, yes, they have some rights similar, roughly similar to a shareholder's rights in a corporation. So the collective can be viewed as a corporation which has shareholders. So each individual farmer cannot claim title directly to the land. The land is owned by the, uh, by the collective. So in that sense, you can say they're identifiable. But on the other hand, I think uh, because the building is illegal, it simply has no legal claim to it. They can probably hold out in a way that they can organize and occupy the space, saying that no government, you can't, tear, you can't take, take down the mountain. You have to pay us. But on the other hand, the evidence seems to show that when that happens, that the organization of farmers happens more at the level of the collective, which it tends to be dominated by a few uh, village officials who are also part of the government. So that didn't happen, and the government seems to have ways in eliminating that. 
And I said no is because the possession are, are currently occupied by rental, uh, as I said, low income rent, uh, rental residents who are actually quite mobile. They're, as I, I showed, they're ready to go anytime they need to go. And it seems to me that based on the field work and the interview, they're not interested in holding out. They, if they are asked by the police to move, they would move the next day and, and move to, to somewhere else. So that issue seems not very serious in, in that particular project. And there are similar projects in the same city and in the cities uh, near, nearby in, in, in that region. Thanks. Okay, and I think, I think it's interesting how these situations can be very messy or very simple. So the simple case is when you have private property owners and another private entity wants to develop theirs, so it simply buys out the relevant property interest. I'm thinking specifically of a very controversial mining project in southern Arizona, and the mining company just bought out all of the grazing leases rather than having rancher opposition to the project. I think the more complicated circumstances, partially what you mentioned, which is when you have an external stakeholder group, like a non-governmental organization, devoted to something like no pipelines, uh, in the DAPL instance, uh, who are going to, the NGO is going to combine with the local stakeholder interest. In my observation, admittedly not empirical, just anecdotal, in my observation that can only happen if the underlying stakeholders have an ideological reason why they will not sell to the developer, right? So in the Standing Rock Sioux example, the tribe had a very strong opposition to the pipeline going through, which then opened the door to the NGO finding resources with a local entity. And then that becomes a question of how strong is the ideological commitment of the existing property owners, and is it sympathetic to a broader public, which in that case it turns out. Just a couple of comments on that. With respect to the pipeline, I represented some of the people there, um, not the pipeline builders, but the support organization. <laughs> Uh, and what was extraordinary is the thing that was not mentioned by Karen, but which is very, very important, is who your lawyer is. And in that particular case, it was Earth Justice. And there are a lot of particularistic oppositions you could raise based upon the National Preservation Act and the kind of notice and consultation you need, some engineering stuff. But the reason they were so willing to go into this all in, as they certainly did, um, was that um, their basic program was they didn't want fossil fuels to be shipped across the United States. And there was simply no way under the, the NEPA statute that you could make that issue have to go somewhere else. The tribes essentially wanted to get into this, not because they were trying to hold out against the pipeline. They created more filth than you could possibly imagine with their protest. But they wanted to renegotiate the treaties under which the various uh, reservations had been put together. And uh, this was a very powerful level they thought could do it. And it got removed for them when the Trump administration and did the Obama administration let the Army Corps of Engineers go ahead. The other point I want to mention about Karen's case, which you know we worked on 10 years ago, is uh, what she said, and I, she didn't stress it in this paper, but it became very clear, is if you looked at the way the guys from Nestle came, uh, they were low-key, reasonable, sympathetic, anything you want to do at the short term, we're willing to do it. This was also true, by the way, of the DAPL pipeline. This rock is sacred to you, we'll build it 10 feet over. Uh, their attitude, they were always making concessions, and the other side was pushing very hard. Why the difference? Uh, because the guys were building the projects know that after they get the project, it's going to still be regulated by the same people who gave them the approval. And the last thing you want to do when you go into a town is to beat everybody up, put the thing up, and then two years later, the vengeance forces come after you. So these guys essentially always back off. It was amazing if you looked at the DAPL pipeline, the number of concessions that were made along the way, and, and rightly so. This is no disagreement. On the other hand, if you're the opposition groups, it's hit and run. You go in, you stop this thing, or you get more money from your kinds of organizations, then you stop it somewhere else. You're not interested in local goodwill because you're not doing anything after the pipeline stops. You're interested in global goodwill from your constituent base. And so what you tend to do is to play to that particular stuff, which oddly enough means that you're more powerful if you take a more dramatic, more fundraising approach to that. And it completely changes the dynamic because one guy's a slugging away and the other guys are trying to use soft diplomacy and cash. And all too often, it turns out that the sluggers win. It was exactly that which happened in the Sorgatuck process. Uh, the environmental groups, you know, uh, they would file actions with this. If you build this project, 
and put this golf course up, you're going to change my view from my property two feet away, and this is the kind of nuisance, pollution-like easement that we have to deal with. Those suits were actually, or not suits, but those letters were actually submitted. So it's a very complicated political dynamic with this fundamental asymmetry. Uh, just a quick observation about the Hyde Park case, which I haven't read. And the original sin there is the idea that the state should pass out corporate charters. Uh, but courts responded pretty eloquent. I mean, and that was a period where that was still, I think, what the de rigor was. Courts responded pretty elegantly with a solution, though, which was two doctrines, ultra virus and quo warranto. I just had to speak Latin while Richard was here. Um, <laughs> which were basically, you know, uh, ultra virus is you've gone beyond what the corporate charter permitted, and quo warranto is you've engaged in contraband-ish kind of behavior, and we're going to forfeit the charter. So that would have been a, a, a sort of elegant solution. I don't know if the, I haven't read a case if the Supreme Court went that way and just say, whatever we were giving you in the corporate charter, there was an implicit ultra virus or quo warranto limitation on your ability to engage in massive levels of nuisance. And that then solves the problem. Because if this was just a private corporation today, it wouldn't really be that. But this, it, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to uh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, well, I mean, look, this was an issue which had been raised in the English courts with Baron Bramwell. Um, He's a decent libertarian, and his position was perfectly clear. In a world without constitutional restraint, <coughs> an authorization to build a pipeline does not exempt me for tort liability, which remains strict. It may stop the kind of injunction. In the Hyde Park thing, they use, you do not construe these charges broadly, you construe them narrowly uh, to get to the same places. And, and by the way, that's because of the limited government issue. Everybody's worried about this, and the public trust doctrine. Um, which I, Tom has written you know, the master treatise on. I wrote this little article, which I think he followed, and I developed the inverse taking doctrine, nor shall public property be given to private use without just compensation. Um, the narrow construction is an effort to stop the giveaway. Uh, the inalienability of public trust problem is an overbroad thing to stop the same kind of problem. But both of those issues exist. Uh, I agree with all that. and. Um, uh, even though I'm sure Richard hasn't read the case for a long time, he remembers it perfectly, uh, not surprisingly. The one thing I'll add that I think does suggest that the fertilizing company really was in a tight spot um, is this set of facts. Uh, so um, everything, at the time the fertilizer factory sets up shop, everything, if you know the city of Chicago as you do, everything south of 63rd is wetlands. Nobody wants to live south of 63rd Street, so two blocks uh, that way. Um, because for many days a year, that, that's part, partially underwater. What the federal government came and did shortly after the fertilizing company got up and running, is the federal government starts making drainage improvements that suddenly make the land south of 63rd Street all the way down about you know, 100 or 110 prime real estate. And so initially, the fertilizer company is looking for a place where nobody lives. And when they set up shop, there were very, very few residents in business coming nearby. Coming to the nuisance, right? But it's coming to the nuisance, and it's coming to the nuisance in, in large measure because of an action that a different governmental body did. And so there's this sort of, and you see this in the Chicago Public Trust case with the lakefront too, different parts of the government have very different agendas and very different goals, and sometimes it's those conflicting goals that give rise to it. Interesting that the leading English case, Sturgis v. Bridgman, which was the basis of the Coast article on nuisance, I think he got it wrong, was decided in 1879 or so, about the same time as this first case. And what they said is, coming to the nuisance is not an absolute defense, but as I mentioned to you, the compound remedy solution. Uh, Jessel, who was the master of roles and a, and a real legal genius, said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to postpone the injunction for four months for you guys in order to get your stuff in order. And that's during the period which you're going to build up your remedy. So it's essentially trying to use the remedial stuff to minimize the interaction. And that's the point that is completely missing in the Calabrese and Muhammad argument, which makes it the biggest wrong search and destroy effort going. Because if you get the remedial structure wrong, you create these two corner solutions, both of which are untenable. You take these middle positions, and it turns out it becomes a, a lot easier. So the correct <coughs> remedy in that case is to give them a little bit of time to unwind the thing, but not to allow them to continue.